Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Steve. And I'm Scott. And together we are Backyard Musings, the science and technology channel. Um, how's everybody doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Now that too. I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's um, talking about a great topic today. Yeah. Let's go right to our topic here. I got to get it on the screen. I'm trying something new. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a unique and rare dark colored organic glass found inside the skull of an individual who died in Herculaneum during the 7980 Mount Vesuvius eruption likely formed when the person was killed by an extremely hot 510 degrees Celsius. That's really hot. hot. But short lived ash cloud. Then it cooled rapidly. This conclusion, based on research published in scientific reports, stems from an analysis of the physical properties of the glass, which is believed to be compri to comprise the fossilized brain of the individual. And what you see on the screen is a picture of that individual. They were in their bed, you know, at wherever. Kind of caught them off guard. Inside of Herculaneum they were, yeah. yeah. Would you like to know more? Glass rarely forms naturally due to specific conditions required for its creation. For a substance to become glass, its liquefied form must cool rapidly enough to prevent crystallization as it solidifies, requiring a significant temperature difference between the substance and its surroundings. And it must solidify at a temperature well above that of its environment. As a result, it is extremely difficult for an organic glass to form as ambient temperatures are rarely low enough for water, a key component of organic matter, to solidify. Yeah, we've got water in our brains, yeah, whole yeah. body, yeah. yeah. So the only uh, suspected natural organic glass was identified in 2020 in Herculaneum, uh, Italy, but was not clear how it, uh, this glass formed. So the closest thing that I've ever seen to, like, this kind of a heat or glass would be, like, uh, obsidian, right? You've seen a chunk of obsidian? Yeah, you know, and it's it's not really clear, but it it's kind of got a glass form to it. I mean, some yeah, of it, it looks does. glassy. It's really yeah. sharp. Yeah. yeah, 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 and shiny, brittle. And, though. And it's brittle. brittle, exactly. I mean, hard, but but again, it breaks easily, like kind of like glass. So yeah, yeah, it's not clear, obviously, but interesting. But now we're going to talk about your. Is this a family member of yours? This guy? No, Father Guido Sarducci. No, no, yeah. no. Okay, sorry. This is Guido Giordano. And colleagues analyzed fragments of glass sampled from inside the skull and spinal cord of a deceased individual from Herculaneum found lying in their bed in the Collegium Augustalium. The results of the analysis, which included imaging using x-rays and electron microscopy, indicated that for the brain to become glass, it must have been heated above at least 510 degrees Celsius before cooling rapidly. And so I'm not a... a a great Celsius to Fahrenheit um, converter, but is that probably about 1500 degrees? Probably is it about three times, right? Is it about three something times? Something like that. There's like a three fifths time plus 32 or something like that, or five thirds. But pretty, pretty yeah. darn hot. So yeah. the authors note that this could not have occurred if the individual was heated solely by the uh, pyroclastic flows, which buried Herculaneum. As the temperatures of these flows did not reach higher than 465 degrees Celsius and would have cooled slowly. The authors therefore conclude, based on modern volcanic eruption obs observations, that a superheated ash cloud, which dissipated quickly, was the first deadly event during uh, Vesuvius' eruption. They theorize that such an event would have raised the individual's temperature above 510 degrees oh, Celsius. Man, yeah. Uh, before it rapidly cooled to ambient temperatures as a cloud dissipated. Uh, the bones of the individual's skull and spine likely protected the brain from complete thermal breakdown, allowing fragments to form this unique organic glass. That's it's crazy. crazy. Yeah, it's like a it's like you'd see in a Indiana Jones movie or something. Yeah, like uh, um, there was a movie Pierce Brosnan was in it. Um, it was about a, 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 an erupt, a volcano erupting in like Washington or something. Like that. St. Helens? Did they do one about, uh, was it about St. Helens? No, it was it was like a fictitious mountain. Oh. Yeah. So what you're seeing on the screen now is a depiction of the eruption of, of Vesuvius from an eyewitness account. And we're going to get into that. Mount Vesuvius violently, violently ejected a cloud of superheated tephra and glasses to a height of 21 miles. Okay. 
So let's put that into perspective. So a mile, 500,280 feet. So you multiply that times that. That's over 100,000 feet. Feet, yeah. Which is what? Five times higher than the highest mountain, right? Isn't it? Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Well, okay. Mauna, Mauna Kea okay, is the highest that. mountain. And how, how tall is that? I don't know from the space. Well, okay, let's say it's 30,000. Let's say it's 30,000. It's still three times or over three times higher. That's crazy. That's high. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, it is high. So, well, a marathon is 26 miles. And if you've ever ran a marathon, 21 miles is. Yeah, but that's long. That's not high. Yeah. I mean, you well, know, yeah. Quick. I mean, just to get a sense of, you know, 21 yeah. miles. So, ejecting molten rock, pulverized pumice, and hot ash at 1.5 million tons per second. That's a that's force right there. That's a lot of tons. Somebody must have been upset at the inhabitants of the earth at that time to do that. Yeah, let's hope we never, I mean, I don't care how much preparation you have, right? You're not going to survive something like that. It's crazy. No, no. Plenty of glass Unless you've around, got right? 510 uh, uh, SPF, uh, 510 Celsius SPF uh, lotion on, you're not going to survive, right? Yeah, no, that, this is, that is crazy stuff. I can't even imagine. I mean, that if, if the, the whole deal with this, right, was that it changed um, the whole... Yeah, the, the 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 atmosphere everywhere, well, right? I mean, it the, can, it ruined and the shoreline, right? But Pompeii changed. used to be right at the shore, and you go there now, and and the shore is miles away. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it changed the the whole earth, basically. So anyway, yeah, uh, ultimately releasing one hundred thousand times the thermal energy of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The event gives its name to the Vesuvian type of volcanic eruption characterized by columns of hot gases and ash reaching the stratosphere although the event also included pyroclastic flows associated with paleo eruptions pele yeah the event destroyed several roman towns and settlements in the area pompeii and herculaneum uh, obliterated and buried underneath massive uh, pyroclastic surges and ashfall deposits are the most famous examples uh, archaeological excavations have revealed much of the towns and the lives of the inhabitants leading to the area becoming Vesuvius National Park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The total population of both cities was over 20,000. The remains of over 1,500 people have been found at Pompeii and Herculaneum. Uh, the total death toll from the eruption remains unknown. Yeah, my wife and I, we went to Rome for our honeymoon, and Pompeii was one of the places... I wanted to visit, and we did, and it was the worst day of my life because I had the wrong shoes. I didn't have arch support, so my feet, my dogs were barking. A lot of walking. Like, later, well, yeah, around, oh, that's all. You don't have carts over there. It's UNESCO World Heritage. Yeah. But you got to see a forum, what a forum looked like with the columns and everything. Oh. You saw the, 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 the little roads that they had. They were very narrow, like eight foot wide, but you could see the ruts where the carts huh. rutted into the whatever the like stone wagon, or whatever like a wagon yeah. Trail. yeah um and it was laid out you know in in grids and some of the places were uh really well preserved you could see like a a, a mural on this wall um that was preserved yeah the, the mural was a, a dude holding the, his big penis i mean it was over exaggerated but it was wild and then in another one a rich area there was this little fawn it was about a a person it's about 16 18 inches tall that was, um, how do you call it? Uh, uh, the the uh, the the size was proportioned exactly to an adult, uh -huh. but it was a little guy, hmm. you know. And they called it the fawn, hmm. F A U N. Um, I'm just amazing. And there was a Colosseum, but it wasn't as big as the Roman Colosseum. That was cool, you know. The gladiators were there, killing and, them, and that was all preserved. All preserved. Crazy. And then um, the new city of Pompeii was next to it, you know. And then um, there were uh, they, uh, we saw in an exhibit off the site. It showed people it, their skeletons, the teeth and the skull, encased in like you know they had pulled back some of the ash, but you could see the skull of that person that died. You know, it was eerie. Yeah. Well, I told you there was a an, a, an exhibit at a museum up in Utah that we were at uh, a couple of years ago, and 
um, we went into it. And I, I mean, I, at first I wasn't too excited about it, but it was part of the deal to get into this museum. So, and it was fascinating. Um, like I said, they had, um, you know, bodies that they had, you know, taken out, exhumed and, and relics and all kinds of stuff. And it was fascinating that that kind of stuff would have survived. I mean, obviously they didn't survive um, mortality. They died, but they were still preserved. I mean, it was just amazing. They found like cooked, burnt pieces of bread in the ovens after they excavated the ovens down where the kitchen was or whatever, yeah. for whatever. So it was probably kind of is or insulated from the, the, the original heat and blast. Right. And then, yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. I'm glad that they were able to take parts and pieces to this Utah museum so that yeah, you I think could it was, see it. And it was a traveling show. I think yeah. a traveling exhibit, they were moving yeah. all around, but we just happened to be there when they were, they had this thing. So. Yeah, it was interesting. Okay, here's the background on this. On October 24th, 79 AD, Pliny the Younger, P-L-I-N-Y, was 17 years old and staying with his famous uncle, Pliny the Elder, a naturalist, author, and naval commander for the Roman fleet at Mycenaeum in the Bay of Naples. His account, written as a letter to the Roman historian Tacitus 25 years later, made the eruption of Vesuvius famous long after Pompeii was buried under debris and forgotten, mm. literally forgotten. Mm. Pliny wrote how the volcanic cloud that initially erupted from the mountain, uh, quote, it was not clear at the distance from which mountain the, the cloud was rising. It was afterwards known to be Vesuvius. Its general appearance can be best expressed as being like an umbrella pine uh, for a rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. I imagine because it was thrust upwards uh, by the first blast and then left unsupported as the pressure subsided or else it was borne down by its own weight uh, so that it spread out and gradually dispersed. And that's from uh, Epistule, uh, what is that, volume 16, volume 20 from the Penguin translation by Betty Raddus. So that was eyewitness. That was Pliny writing that in a letter. Hmm. Crazy, yeah? yeah. Yeah, 79 AD. That's that's what goes back a ways, right? Crazy. Yeah. Pliny, years. Pliny goes on to relate how his uncle then sets off across the bay to Pompeii on a rescue mission while Pliny the Younger stays behind with his mother. His uncle later dies on the beach at Pompeii. His body found the next day. In a second letter, Pliny describes his uncle's last moments based on eyewitness accounts. Wow. Pliny, yeah. Pliny, the, it's, it's amazing that this guy had the courage to go, I'm going to go help and see what I can do to help. Right. You know? And that they were they were uh, journalists back then, right? I mean, they were keeping, keeping records and stuff. Yeah. Pliny the Younger is also able to describe in vivid detail his experiences escaping the eruption with his mother in the dark, so that's the slide we're showing right now, 19 miles from the volcano in the dark. Crazy. All daylight blocked by the explosion with ash raining down upon them. The ruins of Pompeii were not rediscovered until 1599 and not properly excavated until 1748 when the discovery of an almost perfectly preserved Roman society caused a sensation across Europe. That still causes a sensation. Yeah, you know this is saying? a cool story. Yeah, this is really cool. I don't remember ever studying this kind of stuff in school when we talked, you know, when we were studying this part of the You go there, the it's world. fascinating. And they got a little shop there where you can get ice cream because it's pretty hot. And you can get drinks and stuff. And there's bathrooms built right on the site, you know. Oh, big tourist spot, right? Oh yeah. Go oh, there. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's all walking. Um, there's group tours, or you can do like a little app that you can walk the app and it'll tell you, you know stuff as you're walking by but they're still finding stuff to did it today they're still excavating they're not done wow very cool very cool i hope we hope that you enjoyed this segment about this history it's just incredible yeah the dude's brain was cooked in the glass yeah that's just amazing yeah all right thanks folks take care everyone thanks where's the mouse there we go nsa is checking